hello, Rings of Power. It was a thing that people watched and a bunch of them talked about, and now I am also talking about it. And I thought it was, uh, it was fine. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Before we go too much deeper into this, yes, I am wearing contacts. I'm just trying it out. We'll see how it goes. Rings of Power is the biggest, most expensive television show ever produced, which is saying a lot when you consider just how crazy expensive some television shows have gotten lately. And while it's not actually directly based on any of the writings of J.R.R. Tolkien, it does still take place in the world of Middle-earth, and it does still try to serve as a prequel to The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. A very, very distant prequel, though, because this is, like, literally thousands of years before the main story takes place. A lot of people have gotten butthurt about this show for one reason or another, calling it the absolute worst thing ever made, and I mean, there's criticisms to be made, but, like, chill out, okay? Chill all the way out, people. It's really not that worth getting that upset about, okay? Like, it was an okay show with some very good things in it, okay? If you're going to sit here and pretend that there weren't good things in it, then I don't think I should take you seriously as any sort of critic. But basically, the story of this is that the Dark Lord Morgoth was defeated and his primary servant was uh, Sauron, who is, you know, the main villain in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and everyone thinks that he's dead except for the elf Galadriel, who is still going out looking for him, and then there are some other storylines that kind of intersect with all of this, and I'll be honest, the story is probably the weakest thing here. In reviews of the first couple episodes of this show, a lot of people were complaining that the pacing is super slow, and that you just, uh, not a lot was happening, and uh, yeah. The first episode is fine, and then the next several are very, very slow, up until like, I guess episode 6 out of 8, and then things do speed up and pick up a bit more. But even then, it's still a little slow for my taste. It felt like this whole thing had uh, like 4 hours worth of content, but they stretched it into 8 episodes, which is never a good thing. But what's probably worse than that is that this show does something a lot of television shows are doing nowadays, where it has multiple different storylines all going off in different directions, some of which are related to one another, but a lot of times they are very separate, and they may converge at the very beginning and or at the very end, and then there'll be one storyline which doesn't connect at all, and you're left wondering, well, what does this have to do with it? What does it even have to do with this entire show? And you don't find out until the second season. And in this show, that happens to be the storyline with uh, the Horfoots and the mysterious man who falls in a meteor. Now, I will say, again, the first episode where we're just introduced to them and we see the man in the meteor is pretty cool, and the last episode where we learn more about that is also pretty good, but everything in the middle I just could not care less about anything they were doing, alright? And I'll just say this right now, I am familiar with the lore of Middle-earth, but I am not an expert in it by any means, so if I do mess up on, like, understanding some concept or something because it wasn't explained super well in the show, that's why, but I'm not going to go read through an entire encyclopedia just so I can understand a television show. Like, if you have to do that, then you've already failed at world building in your television show. So if anyone is going here saying, um, actually, that was obviously one of the Istufi, or whatever the fuck they're called, and he's clearly meant to be one of the blue wizards that Gandalf references in The Hobbit, like, okay, how am I supposed to know that? You know, I'm just... I know people are going to do it anyways, but I figured I may as well say it. But, yeah, basically that whole storyline, like, I just was horribly bored for six out of the eight episodes whenever that one came up. Then there's the story of Elrond and how he's working with his dwarven friend Durin to try and fix some magical gobbledygook that's going on with the elves. You know, there, there's a magic problem, he must find magic solution. You know how these things work. And that one was fine, but it, it's mostly dialogue, and the only thing that really carried it through was the friendship between Elrond and Durin, because you start to see that, like, oh, okay, elves living so long can affect their relationships with other people, so it kind of makes sense why they might be insular and isolated, because they can't even really form friendships with people who are gone in a fraction of a second, or so it seems to them. Like, you know, hundreds of years to an elf is nothing, because they're just so 
unfathomably old and they live for so, so long. Uh, but yeah, seeing their friendship, it, I liked it. it. It worked for me. But beyond that, I just, again, it was just, yeah, some things are happening. They're kind of neat. And in the last episode, it becomes a little bit more interesting, but it's also really just saying, hey, something neat might happen next season. We'll have to wait and see. Then there's the storyline of all the humans living in the Southlands and how the elves are kind of sort of oppressing them and then orcs show up and that they, they just, um, well, I don't want to give too much away there, so sorry. The way I described it might have made it seem like I didn't like that, but no, that was actually one of the better storylines. In fact, I would say overall it's the best one because there's a very clear threat pretty early on, the orcs. There's people in this area who we do care about, like Bronwyn is nice enough, I liked her, and Arendir the elf, the black elf that certain people just got their panties in a twist over, like, he was genuinely a pretty nice character, I liked him, he was a decent dude, uh, watching him fight, the choreography was always pretty good, and they, he felt like an immortal being who's been fighting for a very long time, you know, he's magical and he's far more graceful than a human ever could be, uh, but they didn't go too over the top with it like they sometimes do, like Legolas surfing on a shield, you know? And especially in the last couple episodes, this storyline picks up a lot. Like in episode 6, there's a big battle, which whether Tolkien would have liked it or not, uh, giant battles and set pieces and epicness is now part of the identity of Lord of the Rings. And while this battle doesn't approach anything near like what those movies got to, it is at least a nice little taste of it, and hopefully we can get some more of that in later seasons. We'll see. And Galadriel's storyline was also overall solid. You know, it, it dips a bit in the middle. Like, I honestly did not care about anything she was doing in Numenor. It was just dull. I, I was not into it, but, you know, it, it was there. It was fine. I didn't hate myself while watching. And, you know, as you may have gathered by all this, like, yeah, the story is just not that strong. It may have been better if this had been cut down, like I said, to around four or five episodes and it had a quicker pace. I may have liked it more, but I don't know, it's hard to say. By far the best part of the show is just the size of it and the way it looks. Like, from the moment it starts, like when you're seeing, uh, like, not just the costumes and the sets, but like the backgrounds and just how huge this place is, the landscapes. Like, I know that uh, they didn't film this in New Zealand, and honestly, if I hadn't heard that, I probably would have assumed they were still filming there because it still looks the way Middle-earth looked in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. So, I don't know, it, it looks great, and then you see places like uh, Numenor and like the place where the elves live and the dwarven lands underground. I, I don't know what its name is, and I don't care enough to look it up. Feel free to yell at me, Tolkien fans, but like they look like these ethereal, otherworldly places, and they have so much detail and they're just so beautiful like you want to step in and just look around for a while even if nothing crazy is going on and it's incredible like I remember before this came out people were whining about how the show looked cheap and I was thinking what the fuck are you people talking about and then it came out and then some of them were trying to change it and say well look none of us were saying that it didn't look good we're just complaining about the story I'm like no you were you were saying that don't let them gaslight you they were just complaining for the sake of complaining. Uh, but, yeah, it just, it looks incredible. And that goes to show you that when you spend a billion dollars on a television show, that will buy you, at least visually, that there's a baseline that you can't go below. You know, like, you, you just can't look too awful when you're spending that much money on something. It's pretty much impossible. But probably the best thing I liked about this whole show is that it gave me more of an appreciation for Middle-earth itself. And that does kind of tie into like the way it looks and how incredible it is just visually. But it really made me feel like, man, this world is huge, way bigger than I even realized, and old. Like, because, I mean, obviously, in the movies, you know that this is a very old place, and it's huge, and there's a lot of people running around, there's different cultures and stuff, and that... That's all great, but then you realize that this is thousands of years earlier, and even at this stage, this world is old. There's already so much history and so much that has gone on. It it really did start to sink in after three or four episodes for me that, like, wow, this place is 
absolutely enormous and deep, like for lack of a better word. Like Numenor and everything, I don't believe is even mentioned in the later, uh, like the mainline story, but it just, it is this place that is so huge and so old that it feels like it could be the setting to half a dozen other decent fantasy stories. And one day it'll crumble away to dust and be forgotten. And that's like the whole theme of Middle Earth, or one of the themes of Middle Earth is that eventually everything will fade away and be forgotten. And the only way to prevent it from being forgotten is to try and mythologize it and tell those stories. I don't know, it just, overall it feels like Lord of the Rings is the type of intellectual property that is more suited to books or movies, which are like big self-contained chunks, you know, rather than a television show, which is where they have to split it into much smaller pieces and spread it out more, if, if that makes any kind of sense. I know that's a weird metaphor, but, you know, with a television show, pretty much by necessity, you have a lot of dialogue scenes and the stories tend to be longer, but they also oftentimes move slower and you have, again, less of that epic feel when it comes to battles and stuff, and just for budgetary reasons, partially, but also just because you can't have a giant battle every episode or it would get stale after a while, whereas if there's only three movies, you can have a giant battle at the end of all three of those and it wouldn't get old. And Lord of the Rings, whether you're going by the original tales where it was kind of a whimsical fantasy adventure fairy tale, uh, where it feels, well, I mean, again, it just, it just feels super whimsical and nothing is meant to be taken all that seriously and logic is kind of thrown out the window a lot of times, uh, or whether you're thinking the movies from 20 years ago where it is a little darker, a little more grounded, but just the scale and the size and the epicness of everything uh, makes it almost unparalleled in terms of just how phenomenal and amazing this movies can be. Like, both of those work, but trying to do either of those in a television show format, and this seems to be leaning more towards the movies where it's trying to make it big and make it epic and make it cool, which I don't have a problem with, but it just doesn't seem to work that well in a television show format. But I don't know. I Like I said, this show is fine overall, and when season two comes out, I'll probably watch it. But I think at the end of the day, that is really its biggest failure. It is the most expensive show ever made, and it's just kind of fine, you know? It, it reminds me of Waterworld, in a way. Like, you know that crappy movie from the 90s with Kevin Costner in it? Like, it, it's about a it's time far in the future where the entire world is flooded because all the ice caps melted, and at the time it was made, it was the most expensive movie ever produced. Like, uh, I believe Titanic beat it out a couple years after. But when you watch it, it's not the worst thing ever. You know, like, there are some fun bits in it, like some of the action is fun, one or two of the characters are enjoyably over the top, especially the villain. The creativity of some of the sets is really great, and remember, this was in the 90s, so they couldn't just uh, use CGI as a crutch very often. They had to actually build all this stuff. Like, that's all fun, but at the same time, the story is kind of dull, and Kevin Costner especially is just super boring, and there's also, like, some weird pedophilia undertones at a few points, like, it's just, I don't know, overall, they kind of cancel each other out, and the movie just winds up being okay. You know, it's the most expensive thing ever made, and it's not an amazing, glorious film that you can watch and say, holy crap, that's amazing, the way you could with, like, say, Titanic, uh, but it's also not an amazing, colossal failure that you can just watch crash and burn and laugh at it, or learn any real lessons or anything from it. Like, it's just kind of okay, and the first season of Rings of Power feels a lot like that to me, yeah? It was fine, and don't let all the exaggerations and crazy people make you think that you have to feel it's bad, or that you have to feel it's amazing or anything. Just come to your own conclusions on it, and if people want to be cunts about it, that's on them. But, I don't know. Uh, that's all I have to say here. Not a super in-depth review, but... It's not the type of show that seems to warrant being super in-depth. It's just kind of fine. That's all. Goodbye. Hello for everyone who watched this far. All these names? Yeah, those are my patrons. Uh, special thanks to all of them. And especially a special 
Special, special thanks to all of my $10 and up Patreon names, people, who are Oppo Savalainen, Olivia Rayen, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dio, Echo, Evie, Flax, Greg Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, L. Lindbergh, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Matthew Baudreau, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Robbie Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, and Wesley. Without you, I couldn't do this. If you want to get your name on here, consider donating to me on Patreon. Or, you know, don't. I, I can't force you, I guess. Um, if you don't feel like doing that, you can always, you know, like the video and comment on it and subscribe to my channel and maybe become a YouTube channel member if that's how you feel. Okay, um, thank you uh, for all the thing. Goodbye.